Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Morris. I'm an archaeologist at the University of Leicester Archaeological Services and back in 2012 I was really fortunate to be given the opportunity to direct the excavation that found King Richard's remains or as my boss Richard Buckley put it, would you be interested in running a two-week excavation in Leicester? You might have to work weekends and oh by the way you might find a king. But before we get into that I need you to put your deer stalker hats on and start thinking as a detective. If you were trying to identify human skeletal remains today, how would you do it? Um, if you were a forensic pathologist investigating a modern case, if you were an archaeologist investigating an ancient case, you would look at um, a set of evidence associated with the remains, you would carry out a set of scientific techniques on the remains, and hopefully by the end of it you would have enough evidence to be able to identify the individual. So we would look at the context of the discovery for instance, the crime scene if you will. We would look at any associated evidence with the remains that might point to an identity. We'd look at the age of the remains. If they were recent it would be a police investigation, if they were ancient it would be an archaeological investigation. We'd look at characteristics on the skeleton that might help point to who that person is. So their sex, their age, their ancestry, their stature, their musculature and so forth. We'd look for any unique identifiers on the skeleton, um, healed injuries, implants on modern cases, etc. We'd look for cause of death. In some instances, certain types of trauma, certain types of disease can leave marks on the skeleton. Um, we could look at lifestyle, we could look at the chemical signature in bones and look at the diet, geographical origin, movement and so forth. We can extract DNA, we could look at dental records, we could carry out facial reconstruction and by the end of it, hopefully, we'd have enough information to be able to identify the individual. Or at least in modern examples, we'd hopefully have enough information to identify the individual. In archaeological cases, this is much rarer. It's much harder to identify ancient individuals as named, identifiable, unique people. Generally, archaeologists aren't looking to identify individuals. They're looking at um, broader demographic data. They're collecting that, that information on populations, past populations, rather than looking at individuals. But occasionally, you get this unique um, event where you find someone that is actually a historic figure and you can successfully put a name to them. So if we look at our crime scene then, we're talking about a period in the late, the latter half of the 15th century where there was, um, England was torn apart by a sort of very bloody but intermittent period of civil war that we call today the Wars of the Roses and it was between two rival branches of the Planta Royal Plantagenet family, the House of York and the House of Lancaster. The House of Lancasters were kings of England, the House of York wanted to be kings of England effectively. By the end of that war the House of York had succeeded, they had, um, Edward IV had come to the throne, there had been a relatively long period of peace and then he suddenly died in 1483 leaving a young son, Edward V, and his brother Richard Duke of Gloucester who was Edward V's guardian ultimately seized power and became Richard III. Richard III ruled for only a couple of years and in 1485 the last Lancastrian claimant to the throne, a man called Henry Tudor, returned from exile to challenge Richard. So he brought an army with him from France landed in Wales, southwest Wales, marched up through Wales into England near Shrewsbury and then turned on to the A5, the old Roman Watling Street effectively, and was heading towards London. Richard was at Nottingham when, he has the, when the news reaches him and so he, um, he summons the Royal Army from across the country and he picks Leicester as the muster point for the army. Why he picks Leicester is because there's multiple um, intercept points from Leicester, old Roman roads that connect with Watling Street. So if he misses the, him on Henry on one of those roads, he can set out and target him on one of the other roads. He's got multiple options. And that's what he successfully does. On the 22nd of August 1485, he successfully intercepts Henry Tudor's advance and forces Henry Tudor to turn and confront him. Unfortunately, whilst it's been a success up to that point, it then doesn't go Richard's way.
and leading a cavalry charge through during the ensuing battle, Richard is killed. We are then told by contemporary chroniclers that after the battle, Richard's body was found amongst the slain. Many other insults were heaped on it, and not very humanely, a halter was thrown around the neck and it was carried to Leicester. The body was carried to Leicester. With the victorious Lancastrian army, then spent several days in Leicester. And the body was put on display, Richard's body was put on display to prove to everybody that he genuinely was dead. It sounds macabre, but when you think about it, all kings and queens of England lie for a period of state after they die. And the point of that is to prove the line of succession, to prove that the old monarch is dead and the new one is legitimately ruling. And it's noticeable with Richard, there is no later pretenders that come along during the Tudor dynasty claiming to be Richard III. The pretenders that come along during the Tudor dynasty all claim to be one of the princes in the tower who all disappeared mysteriously. And therefore there was this possibility to claim you were one of them. But with Richard, everybody believed he was dead. That was never in dispute. A little bit of questioning though has come about where the body was displayed. Um, convention has it in the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a church on the edge of Leicester in a collegiate precinct, which was a Lancastrian mausoleum. And so it sort of seemed appropriate that your dead Yorkist king was laid out on display in your um, defeated Lancastrian, uh, your Lancastrian mausoleum by the, the people that had defeated him. Um, but Greyfriars itself is equally a possibility. The confusion arises that there is, um, the earlier sources suggest that Richard was laid out in a, a church dedicated to St Mary. And unfortunately, there's four churches dedicated to St Mary in Leicester. Um, the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Newark, Mary Magdalene at Greyfriars itself, Mary de Castro in the castle, and Mary of the Meadows, Leicester Abbey, just outside the town as well. What isn't disputed though is where Richard was eventually buried. So three days later Henry Tudor leaves Leicester for London and at that point Richard's body is taken and buried at the Grey Friars in Leicester. This is the Franciscan Friary in Leicester and we know this because again another contemporary chronicler tells us at last Richard III was buried in the choir of the Friars Minor at Leicester. It's a brilliant historic clue. It not only confirms that Richard is buried in Leicester it confirms which church he's buried in, but more importantly, and John Rouse is the only chronicler of the period that is this specific, it tells us which part of the church he's buried in, the choir of the church. That's the sort of the area where the choir stalls are in front of the sanctuary in, in the chancel of the church. So this narrows the search down from an entire country to one city, to, from one city to one church, and from one church to one space within the church that would archaeologically be large enough to find without being a needle in a haystack. The Franciscan Friary had been around for about 200 years before Richard's death. It was a well-established institution in the town, although we don't know why Henry Tudor chose this particular church for Richard's body to be buried in. And nothing survives um, that explains that thought process. Unfortunately, because it was a friary, it fell foul of Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries 50 years later, and it was very rapidly demolished. And by the beginning of the 17th century, the site had been bought by this man here. This is Alderman Robert Herrick. He was a mayor of Leicester, prosperous merchant in Leicester, MP for Leicester on various occasions. And he converted the site into a house and gardens for himself and, he, and his heirs. And in his garden, he reputedly erected a handsome stone pillar three foot high with this inscription. Here lies the body of Richard III, sometime King of England. The only record we have of this in, um, pillar, the, sort of the earliest memorial to Richard in Leicester after the disappearance of his tomb, um, is in a diary entry by Christopher Wren in 1612. And that's the um, famous, uh, the father of the famous Christopher Wren, not, not the architect, but his father. He was visiting Herrick and Herrick proudly showed him round his new garden and showed off this pillar, this memorial in it. The significance here though is the date of this inscription and the wording of the inscription. It seems to be clear from the wording that Robert Herrick still believed Richard was buried somewhere with the, underneath his garden. Here lies, it's very unambiguous, the wording. This is in 1612, this is written down. And this is important because a year earlier, 1611, 
a story was first published nationally that by a man called John Speed that Richard's body had been dug up during the dissolution and paraded through the town and thrown off this bridge into the local river, the River Saw. And this stuck as a very popular story right up to 2012 when we began this the search. And in fact, we still had we had people shouting over the fence at us during the dig saying, uh, I don't know why you're digging there. My history book very clearly says Richard was chucked in the river. The problem with this is that this story first appeared 70 odd years after it was meant to have happened, was written by down by a man who'd possibly never even visited Leicester and who admits himself he doesn't know if it's true or not. But because there was no tomb left that was publicly viewable for people to go and look at, people went and looked at the bridge instead and the story stuck and grew in popularity. And so by the time the Victorian period, next to the bridge was this plaque erected on the building that says near this spot lies the remains of Richard III. The bridge has been demolished, the medieval bridge has been demolished, but the Victorian replacement of the bridge still has that story on it. And the plaque from that building is still there, mounted next to the bridge, still saying near this spot lies the remains of Richard III. Although it does now have an extra little plaque next to it saying this is no longer true. So this was the problem we faced, an initial problem we faced. Where was Richard III? What, had he been chucked in the river or was he buried still somewhere under a street or garden or house or car park in Leicester? Um, and until we actually found the remains, we had no way of knowing which of these stories was true. Our next problem is who is Richard III? So there's been so much written about Richard III, particularly in the Tudor period, uh, um, written by his enemies who've deliberately exaggerated and blackened his name. And then, of course, we've got the brilliant Shakespeare play as well, which has is a play. It's not designed to be historically accurate but has vividly fixed an image of what Richard III is like in our mind. And so when we talk about Richard III and we think of Richard III, we probably either thought, think of the portrait in the National Portrait Gallery or Laurence Olivier, Ian McKellen, Kevin Spacey, Benedict Cumberbatch, and so on. All of these brilliant actors that have portrayed Richard III. And so actually working out what is fact and what is fiction is now very difficult. And going into the project, when we looked at all the evidence and tried to work out what reliable indicators do we have for Richard III, if we found a skeleton, what was it that was reliable that we knew about him? And we concluded the only thing that was 100% reliable was that he was male and that he was 32 when he died, nearly 33. So there wasn't a lot of evidence that we thought was 100% reliable going into this project. But when it was an intriguing problem and when we were approached by Philippa Langley and the Richard III Society, it was intriguing enough that we thought, yeah, this is, this is a worthwhile project. And it wasn't just because we were going to be looking for Richard III. That was one interesting aspect of the project. The project would also allow us to excavate an area of Leicester we never get really a chance to look at. It's the historic quarter of the town. Um, where very little uh, new development occurs and so very little archaeological work occurs and it also gave us a chance to look for the Franciscan Friary itself. It had never been found, never been excavated before and so this was a good opportunity to learn lots of new things about Leicester's story as well and of course we had a chance to find a king as well but to have any chance of finding Richard III we came up with this five research goals and we felt we had to achieve them in order to have any chance of success. So we had to be able to find the Franciscan Friary buildings. We had to be able to work out within the Friary which buildings we had found. We had to then be able to locate the Friary church. We then had to be able to locate the east end of the church, specifically the choir. And within that choir area, we still then would have to find and successfully identify the remains of Richard III. So it did seem a long shot going into the project, to be fair, um, and long shot is probably being generous on it. Um, realistically, our expectations going into it, we thought we would achieve one and two. We would find the Franciscan Friary and work out which bits we'd found. We were reasonably confident we might find the church. 
But we didn't realistically think we'd ever have a chance of finding Richard III, not after being missing for 500 years. And there was a good chance he'd, if he was still buried on the site and not chucked in the river, his remains in those five centuries had been destroyed by later developments as well. So our final problem before we broke ground was where is the friary? It was demolished very quickly. There's very little left in Leicester's townscape today that points towards where it might have been. But there are two roads. One is still called Friar Lane today. And the other was formerly called St Francis's Lane and they run parallel with each other. So there's a good chance between those two roads the friary is located. And within that area, this yellow dotted area outlined, this is sort of where antiquarian descriptions of the friary broadly place it. So we'd never really lost the precinct of the friary. What we didn't know was where the individual buildings were within it. There has been a number of minor discoveries in the area before. Some bits of stone coffin have been found, some bits of window tracery, some bits of medieval boundary walls and so on. But nothing that really pointed towards a church or, or specific friary buildings, except when this row of cottages was excavated um, and built, the cellars for them were excavated in the 18th century when the houses were being built. What, there is an antiquarian record of workmen disturbing human remains. And the antiquary at the time predicted that this was the site of the church and he was pretty close to it. What they'd probably disturbed was either the cemetery just to the north of the church or burials within the north aisle of the church. Um, so we had some suggestion that the car park was a good place to start looking, but we could sort of do some further confirmation that this was the right area to look in by looking at historic maps of Leicester. So this is the earliest accurately drawn map of Leicester. It's dated to 1741. And very conveniently on it, there is an area where you've got this nice rectangular block of land and the word Greyfriars in it. So this is Greyfriars house, Robert Herrick's mansion house. Um, but we know he bought the entire friary site. So his garden boundaries are probably the friary boundaries. And this map is accurate enough that we can compare it with a modern ordnance survey map drop the two together and get a much tighter search area to look in. The problem with that search area though, all of those blue areas are standing buildings. 83% of the site today is inaccessible, either because of the buildings or because of roads going through it, or just spaces that are just too small to dig in. But there are three large open areas still surviving. The central area is was formerly the social services staff car park for Leicester City Council. The larger area on the left is a was a private car park at the time, and the smaller area was the former playground of Leicester Grammar School and is today the site of the Richard III Visitors Centre. So we had a way into the site. We had partners in the Leicester, in Leicester City Council, so we had access to their car park. We had access to the former school playground as well, but we didn't have access to the private car park during the project. And so our reasoning was that we would, with not knowing where any buildings were, we tried some ground penetrating radar and it had been inconclusive. We really just had to dig holes in the ground and see what we found. And so our reasoning was we would try and transect the car park from north to south as much as possible and that we would um, have two staggered 30 meter long trenches by about two meters wide and that they would go into um, across the car park and as the church would be orientated east west we would hope that the um, we would hope that the car park being north-south would cross all the east-west walls and allow us to then identify buildings and then we could put more targeted trenches in once we'd worked out where we were within the friary complex. So our first two trenches then in this social services, this car park, um, we started from the north end and we worked south and that was just simply because we had to get the digger in and out again. And so machining in Leicester, we would generally expect medieval archaeology to be about 
70 centimeters below modern ground level but in this instance it was about 1.2 meters it was much deeper than we expected which made it much more problematic to get to it um, and that was largely because of the site's recent history as a car park so what you can see in this photograph you can see various bits of red brick where the digger is working that are old victorian outhouses and then above it all of this fine gray material is gravel from it being a car park and over the sort of last 80 odd years of it being a car park every year they've resurfaced it with a centi centimeter of gravel or so and rolled it and created this very thick homogeneous layer on the top which is possibly one of the reasons the ground penetrating radar didn't work that efficiently but and so we were going deeper and deeper and not really finding any real clues to the friary or uh, let alone sort of anything medieval in archaeology and we're starting to get a little bit worried that it was going to be too deep to um to reach when the digger bucket lifted up and a bit of bone appeared out of the soil and that bone in some ways was not that exciting a discovery uh, the soil is full of bits of bone it's full of bits of human bone it's full of bits of animal bone where people have chucked their sort of their midden material out into the gardens be up behind the 18th century houses so there's lots of loose bits of bone circulating around in the soil but a closer look at this suggested it had the proportions of a human bone and then a little bit further investigation showed that it was probably the lower left leg of a person and that there appeared to be a right leg to go with it which now that became more interesting that suggested we had a grave um, and as we were looking for a church and we were expecting to find graves this was a good indication we were in the right area but at this point on this first day we had no indication of where the friary buildings were so at this point we still didn't know whether this grave was inside or outside the friary whether it was inside the church if it was in the church was it in the nave the chancel the choir could it have been in the chapter house it could have been anywhere at this point i'm trying to underplay how overwhelmed uh, underwhelmed we were by this discovery but this is um, the first site we had of richard the third although we don't know it at this point um so richard the third had been missing for 500 plus years um, how long does it actually take to find him? It turned out it was just over six hours to find him. We found him on the very first day, although we didn't actually know that at the time. Um, it took another week before we went back and looked at this skeleton further. So it was sort of a week later that we actually realised we'd found Richard III. But as we carried on excavating that first trench, we started uncovering thick layers of um, crushed building rubble, um, lots of building stone, bits of broken roof slates, roof tiles, floor tiles, uh, bits of window glass, uh, window lead, window came, everything to suggest a, a grand medieval building had been demolished and the remains levelled, all the sort of the material that was unusable had be, then been levelled out and spread across the site. So once that was removed then we actually started finding the buildings themselves now in leicester good building stone is scarce so when a building comes that falls out of use in the medieval period generally it is very thoroughly demolished and recycled elsewhere in the town and that's the case here so we've got no real upstanding walls surviving we haven't really even got any foundations in situ the the stone has been very thoroughly removed from the friary but that what we tend to see is where the foundation the empty foundation foundation trenches were and then we see surviving bits of floor between foundation trenches and we get a sort of when you plan it you can see the outline of the building and one of the key bits of bearing in mind we were looking for the choir of the church one of the key bits to help identify where we were within the friary was this bit of stonework here so this is up was built up against the wall of a room inside the friary and on careful and closer inspection it turned out that it was a bench running along the north wall of a small room and there was a southern bench um, as well so it had two this little room it was about five meters wide had stone, fixed stone seating running along its north and south walls and that to us suggested that this must be the chapter house for the friary it's really it was too small to be the church and it was the only building really other building in the friary that was probably going to have fixed stone seating running along the walls proving it was a medieval building we were also making thing discoveries like medieval silver pennies we were getting medieval floor tiles 12th century floor tiles out of it and so forth so we were confident that this was the friary <clears throat> 
Further south again, we weren't finding any evidence for the church itself, but what we were finding was evidence for further buildings that seemed to be extending south from the chapter house. Occasionally bits of wall did still survive above floor level, but they were very rare. This was really the only bit of upstanding wall we found. It survived to about knee height. Uh, it's important in that it shows us the building techniques that the friars were using. It still has plaster sticking to the wall. There is a doorway at one end as well on the right hand side. And then this area in front of it with the sort of the diagonal lines across it is the remains of the floor, which would have originally been a tiled floor, but all the tiles have been carefully lifted up and recycled, leaving the impressions and the underlying mortar behind. So we can actually start building up an idea of what the friary would have looked like. So the floor would have looked like something like this. This is an intact medieval floor from Leicester Abbey. And if you look really carefully on the right hand side of that floor, you can see that the tiles were originally black and yellow and they're laid in an alternating checker pattern. And that's the same type of tiles we're getting from our uh, friary floor, um, blacks and yellows, suggesting that it would have been this sort of this checker pattern effect going down the floors. Although generally they're so worn, they've lost all their glaze. So the first week then in the social services car park, we were pretty confident we'd identified the chapter house and the eastern cloistral range of the friary, but still hadn't got any real indication of where the church was, whether it was to the north of the chapter house or to the south. Convention in monastic buildings like this would usually have the church on the north side, but friaries can be a little bit unpredictable. They tend to be later additions to the urban landscape. They appear in the sort of um, the 13th century really, after towns are already well established and so they have to fit into awkward spaces quite often. And so there are instances, the London Greyfriars for instance has its church to the south. Um, sometimes they have small double cloisters instead of one larger cloister, sometimes they don't even have cloisters, sometimes they just have ranges of buildings around courtyards but they're not joined together. But we did have the grave that we'd found that very first day and that was to the north of the chapter house. So the logic was that we should look north first for the church. But because the area around the grave was very badly disturbed by later Victorian activity, we didn't feel we'd have enough information to identify it within that end of the trench if we expanded that trench. So we decided we'd put a third trench in the school playground um, to the east. This was the beginning of the second week of the excavation and this trench proved much easier to excavate. Unlike the car park area, it didn't have that gravel layer. It was tarmac for the old school playground directly on top of garden soils. And within about 70 centimetres, we came down onto a very nice fragment of tiled pavement, which we were getting a little bit excited about because they're all medieval floor tiles until we realised that this floor is actually on top of the demolition layer for the friary and therefore can't have anything to do with the friary itself. And what this probably is, is one of Robert Herrick's garden paths, and he's recycling medieval floor tiles to create an external floor surface. It doesn't seem to have a building associated with it. Sadly, though, it did not lead to an area with the base of a pillar with a fragment saying, here lies dot dot dot, but um, it was certainly in the area we know was his gardens. And beneath that floor and beneath the demolition layer that it lay on top of, we found the church itself. So in this third trench, we found we were able to identify a substantial building. Again, the walls didn't survive, but the foundation trenches were identifiable, showing that the interior space was about eight metres wide and the foundations were a metre and a half thick and there was buttressed, they were buttressed as well. So this was a, a sizable building running east to west. And within the building, we have a whole series of floor surfaces surviving and within the later floors we could actually identify furniture within the building that helped us work out which bit of the the church it was and that was this area of stonework mirroring the line of the wall running parallel with the line of the south wall and then crossing the interior of the church to the north wall and this is the stone base for the choir stools and then the step up between the choir floor and the sanctuary floor. So that as you walk through the church, you're stepping up as you get closer to the altar.
So this trench confirmed, so at this point we'd not only found the friary buildings, we'd worked out which bit of the friary we'd found, um, that we had in the dig area, and we'd also found the church. And then trench three also identified the choir of the church. What it mainly showed though was that we were too far east within the church. We were actually leaving the choir and going into the sanctuary where the altar would be. So the altar would be sort of bottom right where of corner of the photograph here. We were also in this trench identifying further graves, um, including one in the sanctuary in a stone sarcophagus and two graves in the choir that were in timber coffins. But at the time we were, I hadn't found these, so we'd identified that we were in the choir and by projecting the wall lines back into trench one, we were able to confirm that that grave we'd found on the very first day was not only in the church, but it was in the choir of the church. And because we knew that there was a skeleton in that grave we looked at that first we, so we didn't actually investigate these other graves in 2012 we did have a look at them in 2013 and we were right not to look at them then because all three contained the remains of women who were equally interested and i'll be talking about them on thursday um, but because we had that skeleton we, we that was the one just simply being that was the one we looked at first Lots of evidence then um, from this rubble layer overlying the church that helps us then build up an idea of what it would have looked like. So we have inlaid floor tiles, these lovely encaustic floor tiles with heraldic designs and other geometric and floral motifs and heraldic motifs on them. This one we know is the coat of arms of Richard Earl of Cornwall. We have brass tomb lettering as well that shows that there were some elaborate uh, monuments within the church area that would have had brass lettering inset with them. During the dissolution, all that lettering has been, um, or anything that was of value, metal work and so forth, has been stripped out. And in the process, odd bits have been dropped into the rubble. Um, other little things to confirm that it was a medieval building from the medieval layers between floors layers, for instance, we were getting medieval coins. And this one is particularly nice because it's probably Edward IV, Richard's brother. All this evidence then allows us to reconstruct what the friary was looking like um, back in the in the late 15th century and very clearly showed that that grave on the very first day was at the west end of the choir, tucked into the corner up against the southern choir stall. And using all this evidence, we've been able to reconstruct what it would have looked like. So this is what we think the friary might have looked like shortly after Richard was buried in the church. So on the right hand side, you've got the, the choir containing the, the sanctuary, uh, the chancel containing the choir and the sanctuary. You've got a central tower that's got archeological evidence and then you've got the nave. This is the chapter house and the Eastern range over here. And we do know that the nave had a North aisle. We have a documentary reference for that. What we don't have at any at the minute, and this is just generic on the model, is we don't have any evidence for the southern or western ranges. They're just generic reconstructions. We do also have a fair idea of the size of the church because we friary churches tended to follow a fairly simplistic layout. So within the chancel of the church, the choir and the sanctuary were of equal length quite often. So if we've got the entire length of the choir, we can project the length of the sanctuary. And the nave is quite often the same length as the chancel. So if we've got the entire length of the chancel, we can project the, the, sort of the full length of the church. And so you can see here, as we go through towards the altar, you're stepping up from layers. You walk in between the wooden choir stalls, which are raised above the floor level. The grave slabs you see on the floor are all uh, where we know there are other graves. And we don't actually know what Richard's grave would have exactly looked like. There's only one description of it and no drawings. The description says it was a fine alabaster um, slab with an effigy of the king on it, multicolored alabaster slab with an effigy of the king on it. This reconstruction, which was created by De Montfort University's Digital Building Heritage Group, gives him quite an elaborate tabletop tomb. Personally, I suspect it was more likely to be a relief carved effigy and, and more simple than this, um, with some sort of 3D effigy of the king on, on it instead. But what we found then beneath where this monument was, we found no archaeological evidence for the monument. Um, the area around the grave was very badly disturbed by the demolition of the church and then later Victorian disturbances. So 
we didn't really have a clear indication of floor levels or what happened to the tomb. But what we found underneath it, and this is the skeleton we found on the very first day, was a very surprising grave. So instantly, Joe Appleby, my colleague, the osteologist who excavated the skeleton, and myself who was sort of helping, we could instantly see there were some unusual aspects to this grave, especially as it was in the choir of the church. The grave is too short for the person buried in it, and so the, when the grave diggers have placed the body in the grave, they've had to prop the head up at one end. It's very poorly dug, so at floor level the grave is actually long enough, but the sides all slope down so that the base of the grave is too short. Now it'd have only taken about five more minutes to sort of straighten the grave edges up, neaten them up, and you could have fitted, laid that body out much more neatly and respectfully. Um, the body's on one side of the grave as well as if it's been literally placed down in the first place it could go. There's been no attempt to sort of then rearrange it, and again a little bit of rearrangement might have made it fit the grave better. There's no coffin, and the grave is such an odd shape, you wouldn't have fitted a coffin in here anyway. And we don't even think there's a formal burial shroud. The, the skeleton is lying in the grave very relaxed and loose, as if it hasn't got a fine, formal binding around it. Although that, that doesn't mean that there wasn't a loose sheep draped around it or something like that. We are incredibly fortunate to know that this grave survives. So these yellow lines all mark the modern disturbances around the grave. So on the right hand side all of this soil is the backfill of a pit, a massive quarry pit that was probably where 16th century workmen removed the tower base that is immediately to Richard's west. Um, we've also got what is probably an 18th or 19th century garden feature dug through his feet and that has destroyed his feet but that fortunately that was the only damage actually done to the skeleton in antiquity. Um, otherwise he was completely intact. And then in the Victorian period this cellar was dug over the top of him and if that the brickwork for that had been dug an extra sort of 10 centimetres down we wouldn't have had anything from the waist down surviving in the grave. So we're incredibly fortunate that we've got all of this evidence and without the, um, the complete skeleton it would have made our job identifying the skeleton a much more difficult. But this was a really unusual grave. Everything screamed that this person had been buried with minimal reverence, um, which was unusual for this area of the church. And all the other graves in the church are coffined, either in wooden or stone coffins. So this stands out as different. And as Joe was carrying on the excavation, so when you excavate a skeleton, you tend to work from the outside in, because the head's quite propped up, we'd seen quite early on that there was an injury to the top of the head, which had got us curious, although it still seemed inconceivable at this point that it was Richard III, so we hadn't actually twigged that this could be Richard III yet. The moment of realisation came when the vertebrae were uncovered, and we had this curving vertebrae appear. And at that moment, the penny dropped, really, and you sort of go, hang on a minute, we've got what appears to be a young male adult with a head injury, buried in the choir of the church, who seems to have a hunchback. This has got to be Richard III. I mean, who else can this be? But knowing it's Richard III, and I don't think any of us thought we hadn't found him at this point, and proving it's Richard III are two very different things. So this then led, this discovery of this skeleton led to an international press conference and, and the worldwide sensational news story, and then five months of scientific analysis um, before we were confident to announce to the world in February 2013 that this was indeed Richard III. So this is where we get our detective hats on, really. So we've got a skeleton from the correct crime scene, if you will, um, the right area of the church. There is no associated evidence to suggest it's Richard III, but there is circumstantial evidence on the skeleton that seemed to be convincing. Um, so there was no artefacts in the grave, nothing like that that suggested it, this was a king of England. So we can carry out then a series of an analyses to investigate the skeleton. So the most simplest is to do a visual inspection of the skeleton. Um, this was carried out by Joe Appleby at the University of Leicester, along with many other um, forensic specialists. 
Um, and so they were able to identify using visual observations of the external skeleton and things like CT scans of the skeleton to look inside the bones. So they were able to determine that this was a male skeleton who had, the person had died somewhere in their early 30s, sort of between 30 and 34 years old. They had a very gracile stature, so they were very slim and without the curved spine would have been about five foot eight inches tall in life, although the curvature would have reduced their height. The other characteristics included that the skeleton clearly showed what is called right-sided idiopathic adolescent onset scoliosis, the curvature of the spine. And a radiocarbon date told us that this person had died somewhere between 1455 and 1540. Now that is a broad date. Unfortunately, for this period, you can't get more precise carbon, radiocarbon dates. And that it should be pointed out that basically covers the entire Wars of the Roses right up to the point when the church was demolished. Um, so in itself, none of this evidence proves it's Richard III, but it is consistent with Richard III. When we look at the known historical facts, we know Richard was male. We know he was 32, nearly 33 when he died. And we have contemporary descriptions. Um, John Rouse, who accurately told us where he was buried, describes him as small of stature with a short face. And another visitor to court in 1484 described Richard as lightly built with slender arms and thighs. Rouse also um, talked about Richard having unequal shoulders, the right higher and the left lower. So all of this is completely consistent. And we, of course, we know Richard died in 1485. So at least it doesn't eliminate um, Richard III. So we can then move on from that. So we've got a skeleton. It, we haven't proved it's Richard yet, but everything is consistent with it being Richard. The scoliosis is a genetic condition. It's not congenital. He wouldn't have had it from birth, but it is a genetic mutation. Basically, it's abnormal bone growth on one side of the spinal process has forced the spinal process to twist off in the opposite direction, which creates a 3D sort of rotation of the spine and a sideways curve, not a forward hunch. So this isn't kyphosis, this isn't that sort of classic forward hunching hunchback that Richard is portrayed as. But it is a condition that the Tudors clearly exaggerated for propaganda purposes. Um, so Richard in Shakespeare traditionally has a withered arm, a limp and a hunchback. Now there's no evidence on the skeleton for withered arms or limps. But there is this scoliosis and this is severe enough it would have been medically treated today but there's nothing really you could do in the medieval period it probably manifested around in, during his adolescence and would have got manifestly worse as he got older so this is his spine by the time he's 32 um, but the the curve is quite low down it wouldn't have put undue sort of pressure on his heart or lungs what it would have done though was it was significantly um, reduce his height. So we think if he hadn't had it, he would have been about five foot eight, a little bit above average height in the medieval period. But with it, whilst it's difficult to actually work out what the loss of height is, we think it could be up to four inches. So in reality, um, he could have been standing at about five foot four inches tall. Which, if you'd looked at him, you might have thought then, whilst there was no outwardly visible sign of a disability, you might have looked at him and thought, proportionally there was something slightly off in that his arms and legs might have looked a little bit out of proportion with his torso but otherwise especially with the fashions of the period quite heavy upper robes and longish sort of shoulder length hair you probably wouldn't have noticed significantly that there was anything wrong with Richard um, the only time you might have noticed he had scoliosis was when he bent forward perhaps to pick something up uh, at which point one of his shoulder blades that would have stuck out more prominently than the other because of the way the spine rotated the twist in the spine but otherwise to be honest i think it's pretty remarkable what he did in life considering he, he had this scoliosis during that forensic analysis of the skeleton then the, the forensic pathologists and osteologists were able to find discover that this skeleton had 11 sharp force injuries to the skeleton um, so these were all caused perimortem so around about the time of death. Now, we don't know exactly which one is the fatal injury and we don't know exactly which order the blows were struck in because none overlap each other. 
but from the types of injuries and their placement and the types of weapons used we can suggest a scenario but i have to say it is a scenario and this is my personal take on it it doesn't necessarily accord with everybody else's personal take on it but i think this is probably the closest we're going to get to understanding how richard died so there are nine sharp force injuries to the skull alone six of them are non-fatal there is a puncture wound to the right cheek there is some damage to the right side of the inside of the the jaw and a cut mark on the bottom of the right jaw and then there are three injuries to the back of the head the puncture wound to the face has probably been caused by something called a rondel dagger it's a, a, a dagger that's designed to stab and it's different to the injury to the underside of the jaw, which is a very thin, sharp bladed implement like a knife, something that's been designed to cut. And neither of those weapons could have been used, would have caused the injuries to the back of the head. These are slightly concave and so would have, um, whatever the weapon was, it was very sharp, but it flexed slightly when it hit. And so it's more likely to have been a sword glancing down the back of the head. And these injuries all have minute little striations in them left by the nicks of the blade so if this was a modern case these striations would be creating a unique barcode that you could match a murder weapon with now of course we don't have any weapons but what we do have is multiple injuries and an analysis of the two of the injuries to the back of the head suggested that they were caused by the same weapon but it can't have been the same blow it must have been the same weapon striking twice so these three non-fatal uh, these six non-fatal injuries were struck by at least three different weapons some of them were struck to the face and some of them were struck struck from behind and so we've got a scenario here where we've potentially got multiple assailants attacking this person from multiple directions more of more significance in terms of the seriousness of the injury there is this puncture wound to the top of the head this was the injury we saw originally on the skeleton this is something that has struck a direct blow on the top of the head and has glanced out in the direction of the arrow it's done enough damage to have pushed two little flaps of bone into the skull cavity but it, the blade itself hasn't actually penetrated the skull so it's sort of like um it's probably that either the person striking it was off balance or the person being struck was off balance and so it hasn't directly connected this has got a very unique shape this injury and it is almost certainly caused by something called a rondel dagger which was carried by soldiers in the medieval period as a coup de grace weapon it was simply designed to kill people after they were already on the ground and it has a big pommel that you can put your hand again and sort of push down basically so it's a nasty weapon on the top of the head but in this instance it hasn't directly impacted so it's serious it might have long-term repercussions but in itself it's not instantly fatal there are two fatal injuries to the skull though they're both on the underside of the skull this small hole on the upper side of the photograph and then this large hole on the bottom the larger hole has been caused by something chopping down on the back of the head, something like the axe blade on a halberd or a sword coming down on the back of the head. The other fatal injury has been caused by something being driven up from underneath. And that has gone all the way through the skull and impacted on the roof of the skull. So it, it went through ten and a half centimetres before it stopped. Both of these injuries, for all intents and purposes, are instantly fatal. But they also can only have been struck in a specific way. The only way you can get these injuries to work is if this person's head was on their chest. And now that's really to do, hard to do naturally if you are standing upright or moving around. But if you are on your knees, or you've already been driven to the ground and you're already on your knees semi-conscious with your head dropping forward, or you're already face down on the ground in armour, your head would then drop forward making these angles possible so these do suggest a scenario what we know of the battle and there's very few descriptions of how richard died generally chroniclers of the period just credit him as dying bravely fighting in the battle but what we understand is he led a cavalry charge that seemed to have lost momentum behind henry tudor's lines very close to henry tudor himself and that 
either his horse got stuck in marshy ground or was killed, but he ended up having to fight on foot and becomes isolated and cut down. And there's various um, sort of indirect references to Welshmen killing him or and him being killed by a halberd and various other things, but nothing really that specific. But the blows to the head do suggest a scenario. For a start, they suggest he can't have been wearing his helmet when he died. When you look at this reenactor re here, this is the sort of armour Richard would have been wearing. And the protection it gives the head in all the places where these injuries have been struck means it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to cause those injuries if he was wearing a helmet. So we think Richard, for whatever reason, was not wearing his helmet at the point he was killed. Whether that was he'd lost it, he'd taken it off to improve his visibility, it had been ripped off, we don't know. But we think that he, we, we're pretty confident he can't have been wearing it. He doesn't really, though, have any other injuries on the rest of the skeleton. There is an injury to the pelvis, an injury to the back of the ribs, but we think those are more likely to be post-mortem, so caused after he died, perhaps with the looting of the body or during as the body was moved back to Leicester. There's no defensive injuries on his arms or hands or anything like that. And that, to us, suggests he is wearing armour and it's doing a good job of protecting the rest of his body. Um, so this is, there's a scenario here. It looks like then this person, this Richard, was surrounded by multiple assailants carrying three or four different types of weapons and the initial flurry of non-fatal blows knocks him either to his knees or face down on the ground and then he's killed on the ground. It's just taken me a lot longer to tell you that than it would have taken to kill him. I mean we've seen reenactors try and sort of mimic all the blows as quickly as they possibly can and they've managed to hit sort of in a moving scenario they've managed to roughly hit all of the right places within 30 seconds with four of them um, so Shakespeare's prophecy um, is Richard's mother's prophecy in Shakespeare is that bloody will be nine end it's definitely that but I think a very bloody end but it would have been very quick it's not just the gory details about Richard's death, though, that we learn from his skeleton. We can also look at the chemical signatures in his bones and teeth and model what he um, things like his geographical movements during his life um, and his diet as well. So we by looking at the chemical signatures in his teeth, his right femur and a fragment of his left rib cage, we've been able to model his in roughly his entire life. Now, this is just the oxygen isotopes. Our oxygen isotopes in our, our, the different ratios of isotopes of oxygen in our bones comes from our drinking water. Um, and in antiquity, when we weren't reliant on reservoirs and filtering and mineral waters from all over the world, our drinking water was local and therefore the chemical signature of that, that oxygen, that unique oxygen signature is very localised and you sort of, it's plotted in these contour maps for the country. So when we look at Richard's oxygen isotopes in his bones, we can see for the first six years of his life, he was firmly within sort of the green area of England and Scotland. OK, that's a big area, but that is consistent with Richard being born at Fotheringhay in Northamptonshire and then spending sort of around the first six years of his life at Fotheringhay, as far as we can tell. That's not the significant bit. The significant bit is this anomaly at around about the age of eight, he clearly moves somewhere else, somewhere to the edge of the yellow area. And that is consistent with a known move by Richard to his father's castle at Ludlow in Shropshire on the Welsh border in 1459. And then for the rest of his life, he's firmly back in the green area. And that is completely consistent with what Richard did for the rest of his life, which was effectively traveling from south to north uh, uh, through the eastern side of England. But then we have a final anomaly. In the final few years of his life, his oxygen isotopes again change quite significantly. And if we take this at face value, it would suggest that for several years, Richard was li living in the Western Isles, Western Ireland or Penzance in Cornwall. Um, and we know that's not true. We know exactly where he was during the last few years of his life because he was a king of England and his journey is very well documented in those years. So there is an anomaly here that we have to explain and we can perhaps understand what that is when we look at his diet. So similar to oxygen, we can plot his carbon and nitrogen isotope 
the um, ratios and get an idea of what his diet is. So the carbon um, information basically tells us whether Richard was eating a predominantly terrestrial diet or a predominantly maritime marine diet, so seafood. And then the nitrogen isotopes are telling us where in the food chain he is. If the lower down you are, the more vegetarian you are, basically, and the higher up, the more carnivorous you are. So this graph shows a selection of different medieval cemeteries. The blue dots at the bottom show a medieval rural cemetery from Warren Percy in Yorkshire. Suggests that that medieval peasant population was eating a largely terrestrial diet, which was predominantly vegetarian with small amounts of um, herbivore animals in their diet. The green and the purple dots show two different urban diet spreads. So the green dots are Fishergate, the cemetery at Fishergate in York, and the purple dots are St. Peter's Cemetery in Leicester itself. And these show that people in towns had a much broader access to food. They have much more access to seafood and to food effectively that eats other food. So fish, wild fowl and things like that, rather than herbivore animals. Richard's diet for the bulk of his life is fairly consistent and it's at that top end of that sort of medieval urban diet as we'd expect. But again, in the last few years of his life, we can see his diet gets even richer. And we can tell from his diet that he's eating about 25% seafood um, throughout his life. But that's probably not that surprising because seafood, of course, you can salt and preserve. So it's an ideal travel food. And if as someone like Richard, he spent a lot of his time traveling between places, um, you'd sort of understand that sort of diet. That doesn't necessarily explain how rich his diet is. But if you look at this list on the bottom left, all of these items here are the food Richard ate during his coronation feast. Um, so we, we've got the titles of the dishes from his coronation feast. We haven't got the exact list of ingredients, but these are all of the things that appear in the, the dish titles. And what you can see here is consistent with his diet. The red is predominantly wildfowl. The blue is, is all fish. Uh, there's not a lot of vegetables, the greens in here, but that's just because they only appear in the titles if it's something fancy like lemons or something with lemons or something with apples. And he's actually eating very little herbivore animals, so venison, beef, mutton and rabbit, but there's, they're a minority in his diet. This is why his diet is so high in the last few years of his life. What we can see here, because this is a, a named individual, this is a unique way of looking at this information, we can actually see that how his diet changed from being a leading royal duke of the realm to becoming king of England. After he becomes king of England, his diet gets even richer. Ooh, wrong way. So does this mean that this anomaly in his oxygen isotopes is diet related? And it may be because if you carry these red contours down and across into Europe, the red areas of um, these particular isotope ratios go down into southern France, Portugal, Spain and so forth. And so the suggestion is because he has got a noticeable and deliberate diet change in the latter years of his life, that these oxygen isotopes suggest he's not getting the majority of his oxygen isotopes from local drinking water, but from some other source. And the suggestion is that it's foreign imported wines, that he's getting more of his oxygen isotopes from um, imported wine than he is from local beer and boiled water. That's not saying he's alcoholic. That's just showing that once he's king of England, his diets, his palate becomes more sophisticated, if you will. Um, it's not at all saying he's drinking more alcohol. It's just saying the type of alcohol he's drinking is changing. But this, you can't often do this sort of stuff because with, unless you know who the person is and what they did in their life, a lot of this information is, is too broad to actually suggest these sorts of uh, details. The final strand of the investigation then was the DNA. So my colleague Turi King and um, Kevin Shura, our genealogist, um, were working on this aspect. So the idea was to extract Richard's mitochondrial DNA which is the most useful bit of our DNA for ancestral studies. So it's how it works, keeping it as simple as possible, is that mitochondrial DNA is passed down through the female line. So everybody has it. We all inherit it from our mother, but only women can pass it on. So taking this couple at the top of the, the family tree here, 
the mother will pass her mitochondrial DNA on to all of her children, whether they're male or female. But only the daughter will pass on the same mitochondrial DNA to her children. Uh, the male is the last of the line. So as long as it goes through an all-female line, it will pass down intact from generation to generation. And we can look at the same. On the male side, we can look at the Y chromosome, the, the chromosome for maleness. And only, so only a man can pass that on, and that will pass on intact from father to son to father to son, and so forth. So looking at Richard's family then, so this is his um, immediate family tree. You've got his father and mother at the top, Richard Plantagenet, the Duke of York, and Lady Cecily Neville. And then you've got all the children that survived to adulthood. Richard was the seventh and youngest child to survive to adulthood. Now, the first problem we have is that Richard himself has no lineal descendants alive today. So he had a son who predeceased him and was only 10 when he died, so didn't have any children. And next problem is that the House of York on the male side went extinct in 1499 when the last male heir of the House of York was executed for treason. So there are no lineal male descendants of the House of York alive today. If we want to do Y chromosome studies with the skeleton, we actually have to trace Richard's family back up through his father, all the way back several generations to Edward III, and then down through the House of Lancaster to find living relatives that could be used as comparative DNA samples. That we have done, um, and so far it hasn't proved a successful match, but it doesn't mean that it's not Richard III, it just means that there are issues, false paternal events in the family tree. But actually, more reliably, we were, um, for archaeological reasons and genealogical reasons in this instance, we were more interested in the mitochondrial DNA. We were interested in finding a modern female line descendant from one of Richard's three sisters. And actually this was what triggered Philippa Langley's search in the first place. So back in 2005, a historian called John Ashdown Hill published a completed family tree from Anne of York, Richard's oldest sister, all the way down to a woman called Joy Ibsen. And so when you look at this family tree, you can see that every single line here is, is Mother, daughter, mother, daughter, mother, daughter, mother, daughter, a complete female line of descent. Now, Joy Ibsen sadly died before the project got off the ground, but she has children and her son, Michael, who would have inherited her mitochondrial DNA, kindly volunteered to come up to Leicester and spit into a tube in a car park for Turi King, which was sort of a bit of a weird first meeting between the two of them, I guess. Um, and so this then we means we have a sample of mitochondrial DNA that we can compare with the skeleton to see if they are related. They, they share a common female ancestor. But if there is no match, we don't know if that's because the skeleton and Michael aren't related or are related or whether there's an error in the family tree. Now, generally, um, with the female line of descent, we always generally know who our mother is, so there's less likely to be false maternal events going on. But sometimes illegitimacies and adoptions um, aren't talked about and aren't documented. So whilst you can have some a family tree that looks 100% perfect on paper, which this one did, documented for every single link of the chain with verifiable documents that prove the relationship between each person, it could be that genetically there is a break. We don't know. If there's no match and we've only got one comparative sample, we, we don't know if it's a problem with the science or a problem with the family tree or it just isn't Richard III. So it's really important to find a second line of descent from Anne of York, splitting off from as close to Anne of York as, as we could get. And this was done by a professor at the University of Leicester called Kevin Shurer once we'd found the skeleton. And he was able to find a second lineage so this is Wendy Doldig. She's sometimes in literature referred to as lineage two. And again, we can see she descends from Anne of York through an all female line of descent. The family tree splitting at Catherine Manners. So Catherine Manners, two daughters, Barbara and Eva Hilda Constable. So the, the idea here is if we can compare Michael and Wendy's mitochondrial DNA and it matches, we know this family tree must be correct. We can then compare Michael and Wendy's mitochondrial DNA with the skeletons to see if it is correct, as if it matches as well. And if it does, what we can then say is that Richard III, Wendy, Michael and the skeleton all share a common female ancestor. The important thing here with this type of DNA study is 
is it does not prove it's Richard III. It's just another step in the chain. So this is what we did. So the match is over the entire mitochondrial genome, which is over 16 and a half thousand bases long. So that's the little, the, each peak here, the little letter at the top is a base. Um, this is just purely 50 bases as a representative sample, just to sort of to make a slide. If I just put all 16 and a half thousand in, you just see a black line effectively. So the interest, uh, your interest here is in the color changes, not the shapes of, of the peaks of the, the wave. So this is a section of Michael Ibsen's mitochondrial DNA. And this is a section of Wendy Doldig's mitochondrial DNA. And we found that in the 16 and a half thousand um, bases of the genome, there was just one base difference between Wendy and Michael. And that's uh, not unexpected. That's a simple mutation that's occurred in the, the, the generations that they're split apart. I mean, they're very, very, very distant cousins. Um, and so you would expect to see one or two random little mutations in differences. And then we compared the skeletons and the skeletons mitochondrial DNA perfectly matched Michael Ibsen's mitochondrial DNA and again had that one base difference with Wendy Doldig's. So we can be absolutely positive that the skeleton shares a common female ancestor with Michael, Wendy and Richard III. So how do we then prove this is Richard III? So effectively the mitochondrial DNA gives us a suspect pool. Through genealogical research, we were able to identify that alive in England between the mid 14th and the mid 16th century, there were 144 people that would have had the same mitochondrial DNA as Richard III. And you can see them represented on this chart. So here's Richard III on the right. He inherits his mitochondrial DNA from his mother, Cecily Neville, his grandmother, Joan Beaufort, and his great grandmother, Catherine Swinford, and so on back in time. Now, Richard is not unique in this list nine people other people died in battle so nine other people potentially have similar battle injuries to richard on this list and that's not surprising because they were alive during the period of civil war and we would expect to see a few of these people dying in in that civil war richard wasn't even unique at bosworth at the battle of bosworth george talbot the fourth earl of shrewsbury would have had identical mitochondrial dna and fought at the battle of bosworth for henry tudor However, he can't be our skeleton because he died aged 60 in 1528 and therefore his skeleton would be of an old man, not a man in his early 30s. And so we can use all this evidence we've collected from our skeleton to build our case. So I only need three bits of information from the skeleton to eliminate 130 of these people. So when we plug our skeletal evidence into this chart we know our skeleton must be one of these people in this chart we know our skeleton is male so instantly we can remove all women from the family tree they're, they're eliminated as suspects our skeleton was of a young man he died in his early 30s so anyone younger than 30 and older than 34 can be eliminated and we also know that our skeleton from the radiocarbon date died somewhere between 1455 and 1540. So anyone who died before or after that can also be eliminated. So that leaves just 14 people that our skeleton could be. But then we've got all that other information we've collected from the skeleton and all the other associated information and contextual information as well. And so our skeleton has to be someone who died violently in battle, had scoliosis, was buried in the church of the Greyfriars in Leicester, had matching physical description of Richard III's, trauma consistent with the manner of Richard's death, geographical movement consistent, suitable royal diet and so forth. And when you plug all that information in and look at who's left, there is only one person left who cannot be eliminated. And that's Richard III. It's why we can be 99.999% confident at a conservative estimate. Um, effectively, we can be 100% confident that that skeleton we found under the car park back in 2012 was Richard III. It can't be anyone else. It, it is simple um, detective work that managed to make that identification. But we couldn't have done that on our own. This project owes a lot of thanks to a huge number of people, hundreds of scientists, researchers, volunteers, 
have helped make this possible, but we've particularly got to thank Philippa Langley, whose inspiration and enthusiasm brought it to fruition. We couldn't have done this without her.